thanks very much for the introduction and thanks once again for the opportunity here. Um, in the introduction just now, Paul Arna mentioned the word equivariant and we'll see um, how much time we have today and whether we actually even get to that stuff. I'm hoping at least to talk a little bit about the equivariant groups. Okay, so last time we um, talked about the setup for the C motivic atom spectral sequence. Okay, and what you can see on the screen is the formulas, the key formulas, right, um, for the, co the, mo the homology of a point, right, and for the, uh, for the dual steamer algebra. Okay, and we talked about how this is a deformation with parameter tau, right, uh, deforming the classical situation, okay, and I talked at the end a little bit sort of about a philosophy that um, that really kind of where this deformation really lifts to homotopy theories and various interesting aspects of that and I'm kind of encouraging people to take another, uh, take a deeper look at this sort of thing. Um, one very specific problem that I hope might be solvable with these techniques is to construct the analog of of TMF, of topological modular forms in the motivic context. There ought to be a k-motivic modular form spectrum over, over every k or some large class of, of fields k. And possibly this sort of deformation perspective would get would shed some insight into how to how to construct it. That's how the c-motivic modular forms cons, um, spectrum has been constructed using this deformation approach. And, um, and perhaps one can, can do this more generally. Okay, so let's take a look at some, um, at some, oops, not that one, um, this one. Okay, I wanna look at some C-motivic atoms charts to show you some of the features that, um, that, that appear, sort of the exotic features. Okay, so what you see here, this is a C-motivic X chart, okay? And um, what you see in black, the things in black are exactly the same as the classical um, X, okay? And the things that you see in color are sort of exotic phenomena, okay? And the first thing you see right here is this guy H1 to the fourth, and it's red because that H1 to the fourth is tau torsion. H1 to the fourth is non-zero, but tau H1 to the fourth is zero, okay? And then there's this arrow here because there's an infinite tower of H1 multiplications, and another arrow here, and another arrow here, and more arrows over here, and so forth. And that's all H1 periodic stuff. Okay, the magenta line here has to do with the um, has to do with sort of like with the extension. It's saying that if you take this element and you multiply by H naught, you don't get H1 cubed. You actually get tau H1 cubed. Okay, and so there's some tau shifts in some of these multiplications, and that's what those colors are doing. Okay, and if you go further, you see lots and lots of these red arrows, right? All these different red arrows that indicate. Um, that indicate tau torsion. Here are some tau torsion elements, these red dots that aren't related to H1 periodic, but they're still, they're still tau torsion. Okay, so that's sort of exotic stuff. And if you go out further, eventually, and here are now we're in the 40s, okay? We're in, in dimension 40 here, you see a blue dot, you see the first blue dot, and that blue dot is tau squared torsion, okay? And if you go into higher and higher, and there's a green dot there, which is tau cubed torsion, and you would expect to see higher and higher tau torsion as you proceed further and further out, okay? So there's a question. I'm using the word exotic. Um, why am I using the word exotic? What do I mean by exotic? Here, here what I'm using, okay, so I use exotic loosely in lots of different contexts, but what I mean by exotic here is that it is not detected by the classical situation. Okay, that's that's what I mean here. Exotic. It's a new f phenomenon that's genuinely motivic and not classical. Okay, um, things that are detected by TMF are things that we consider to be quote well understood unquote. But um, but that's so that's sort of exotic in a different sense. Okay, um, so tau torsion. Okay, and one of the things about reading these charts. Okay, is that this this C-motivic atom spectral sequence is trigraded. There's the topological degree, there's the motivic weight, and there's also the atoms filtration, right? And so the, the horizontal axis, as usual, is the topological degree. The vertical axis in this picture is the is the atoms filtration, and this picture does not show the weight. Okay, so you have to look up on tables, you have to look up the weights of various elements if you want to know what the weights are. You can't read them off from this graphical picture. Okay, so let's get back to computing 
So um, how would you go about making this computation that I've just shown you? Well, you can compute by machine and we have lots and lots of, of machine data well into the uh, well into the mid between 100 and 100 to 200, around 150 or so is how much computer data we have. So plenty of computer data, okay? And you can also use um, a motivic version of the May spectral sequence. So I'm not gonna do this in too much detail, but just to give you a sense of what happens um, to compare the classical and the motivic um, May spectral sequence. Classically, what you have is a different, you have a differential that creates this relation H1 cubed plus H naught squared H2. Okay, that's what happens. Okay, motivically, you have a very you have a similar differ, differential, except there's a tau inserted in the formula there. Okay, and that tau has to be there to make the weights balance. The weight of H1 cubed is three. The weight of H naught squared H2 is only two, and you have to have a tau in there of weight minus one in order to make things balance out. Okay, so you see lots of of sort of like you see many of the same formulas with taus inserted, and you also see it, what I would call exotic formulas that don't have any classical analogs. But this is an example of a formula that has a classical analog except with taus in there, okay? One of the interesting things about this, right, is that then what this implies, when you multiply this formula by H1, what you get is a differential killing tau times powers of H1, okay? But the H1, it's the power of H1 itself was non-zero. And that's that H1 periodic, um, that, that red arrow that we saw on the previous chart. I'm just showing you symbolically how those red arrows actually, how that H1 periodic stuff actually shows up when you carry out the computation. Okay, last time we did an extended example with the Cobar complex to compute the Massey product in the classical situation, H naught comma H1 comma H0. Okay, and you can do the same thing in the, um, in the motivic situation. Okay, and just to remind you, remember how, these, how the correspondence goes. Classically, you had the zetas, okay, and motivically you have the taus and the xis, okay, but the taus correspond to the, the zetas themselves, and the xis correspond to the zeta squareds, okay? That's what happens when you invert tau, right? Then the xi becomes this tau i squared, okay? So if you make that analogy that zeta is tau and zeta squared is xi, then you do exactly the same thing, okay? I'm not going to talk through all these details right now, Okay, but if you want to, as a good exercise, right, you can go back later and I'll share these notes. You can go back later and go through and check these for yourself, right, and see how you want to see how this works out. What I want to highlight, this is, this is again, with the correspondence that I just said, that tau is zeta and c is zeta squared, this is all exactly the same as what we did classically, okay? This is all exactly the same, except there's one spot where things go differently, okay? And that happens right here. You end up, in the end, computing that H naught comma H1 comma H naught is detected by C1 bar tau zero squared, okay? That's what happens when you carry this out, you get this, okay? And then this is the one place where things are different. You use the relation that tau zero squared is tau C1, okay? And you get that the Massey product is detected by tau times C1 bar C1. C1 is H1, tau is tau, and you end up with tau H1 squared. Okay, so this Massey product motivically has a tau H1 squared. Okay? I re highly recommend going through this computation yourself and seeing at this step where the tau shows up and that's the only difference, right? And it really illuminates a lot about how, what you kind of, how things work and what you expect to see and how things can be slightly different in the motivic situation, okay? The other computation that we did yesterday was we used the May spectral sequence to compute the classical cohomology of A of 1. Okay, and we got this thing involving the H naughts and the H ones and the V1 squared and so forth. Okay, and um, you can do the same thing motivically. Okay, and I'm not, again, I'm not going to go through all the details because they're very, but they're very similar to the, the classical situation. But, um, but again, it would be a good exercise to go through these if you want to spend some time after the talk, go through this and see if you can understand exactly how things work, okay? You have the same D1 differential and you have essentially the same E2 page except for a tau, okay? Then something slightly different occurs. You have, we had this D2 on V1 squared hitting H1 cubed, okay? But now it hits tau H1 cubed instead, okay? So this differential, does not kill off that black dot. What this differential does is it makes that black dot into a tau torsion class, okay? So it's a little different that way, okay? And then the E infinity page, rather than having killed H1 cubed, we merely made it H1 
uh, we immediately made it tau torsion. And so that's what I used an open circle and a color to indicate these black dots are tau free classes, but these red circles are tau torsion. Okay, and you, what you get in the end is in, in this motivic A of one situation, you get this H1 periodic stuff happening. Okay, so you can see, um, anyway, so there, just, just a little glimmer of the first sort of exotic phenomena, the first thing that, that happens here. Okay, all right, so I, I know that I didn't go through all the details here. I just wanted to just kind of sketch these for you. And if you really want to understand these last two examples, you probably need to spend some time on your own sort of thinking, thinking things through. A little more carefully. Okay, so we um, have talked a lot about X. Now there's a question. Does the motivic Steenrod algebra A have the usual sub Hopf algebras A of N like the ordinary Steenrod algebra does, or are there additional exotic sub Hopf algebras? Okay, so that's a good question about subalgebras of the motivic Steenrod algebra. So in the C motivic case, I think I know the answer. In the C, C you really want to, when you talk about subalgebras of the motivic Steenrod algebra, you really want to think of them as um, M2 subalgebras, as subalgebras over the homology of a point. Okay, and if you do that, then the, um, then at least in the C motivic case, you get exactly the same sub, um, sub hop algebras. Okay. I guess I don't know the answer for sure in the general case, in the R motivic case, or in the, or more generally in the K motivic case. I would expect there to be a similar classification, okay? Because everything is sort of free over, over the homology of a point, I would be surprised if there was anything kind of exotic happening at that level of sub, of sub help algebra. But I'm not sure. I'm not completely sure. Okay, so. The next thing we've talked a lot about how to compute X groups, all this algebra, this is step one of our three-step program. Step one is compute X, step two is compute differential, step three is to compute hidden extensions. So let's now move on to step two and talk about the, how to find these differentials, okay? So one thing you can do is find relations implied by TOTA brackets. Okay, and that um, involves the kinds of shuffling and, and manipulation. We did some examples with Massey products um, yesterday. Uh, yeah, yesterday. And you can do the same kind of thing, but with Toda brackets and shuffling them around and using various formulas in order to deduce relations and that then imply differentials. Okay, so that's one thing you can do. And that is roughly speaking what Mahowald's program was. Okay, Mahowald carried out the computation um, of stable homotopy groups out into well, depends how you mean, you know, let's say into the 50s, okay? And he was able to do that, like by sort of exhaustively finding these types of, he and co-authors were able to do this by finding, sort of exhaustively finding all of these, the relations implied by total brackets, okay? Um, but it, eventually it gets, it gets too hard, okay? Um, there's a question and I'll get to that in a second um, when, when, when I get down there. Okay, um, so there's another approach, and this the approach is really kind of the, the innovation that has allowed us to, to push computations out into, into much higher stems in recent years, okay? We've talked about how the C motivic category is a deformation, right, with um, generic fiber, the classical homotopy theory, so there's a functor here that's related to inverting tau, okay? And there's a functor here into S mod tau modules, which is setting, like setting tau equal to zero, basically, okay? Um, and it turns out that this category of S mod tau modules is isomorphic or equivalent to the derived category of BP star BP co-modules, okay? So BP star BP here is um, a, a sort of a, a package that, uh, that I don't want to get into too many details because this goes outside the scope of, of these talks. But let me say that BP is the classical Brown-Peterson spectrum, okay? That's, that's the thing that the Adams-Novikov spectral sequence is built out of. Okay, and BP star BP are the, the operations, like the, you know, like the Hopf algebraid of operations in that BP theory, okay? And so, but this is an entirely known algebraic thing, okay? BP star BP has been computed. It's complicated, but it's been computed, okay? It's sort of like the analogy, it, it plays the analogous role of the Steenrod algebra in BP theory. That's the way to think about it here, okay? And you gotta work with co-modules over this thing, but this is an algebraic category that can be studied by computer, right? And so the idea is that you compute in S mod tau modules by machine, because it's entirely algebraic, co-modules, okay? And then you can use naturality to pull back differentials here, and then use naturality to push differentials down here, 
Okay, and what this does is it gives you, this technique gives you a huge number of Adams differentials up here, which typically you think of Adams differentials as having, um, inherently having topological content, um, but we're actually doing them by machine using this comparison, and that's a huge advantage. There's still differentials that we have to analyze with TOTA brackets in an ad hoc way with TOTA brackets, but this gives us a huge, a huge head start, okay? All right, great. Um, and let's take a look just for just for sort of you know maybe cultural purposes or something. Let's take a look at some of these. Ad Oops, I, want, I think maybe we'll look at the classical Adams differentials. Okay, just to give you a feeling of of what this look. This is a classical Adams chart because it's a little less busy and we can see a little more clearly what's going on. Okay, I, we have similar charts in the Motivic case. Okay, and what you see, these blue lines are D2 differentials. There's the first D2 differential. That's very much related. That's that's Adams Hopf invariant one work essentially that differential. Okay, there are D3s showing up already here. Okay, lots of D2s in this range. These were more or less work. These were worked out, I think, by May. Okay, in the um, the, I guess in the late 60s probably. Okay, and May got stuck here, I think. He could not resolve this D3 right here, okay? Then you get into the range here. This is Mohowald's range in the 30s and 40s and so forth. And you can see there's some D4s in green showing up here. And the things, things are getting quite complicated, right? Not so bad, a little bit calmer for a while, right? And then around 60, things really kind of heat up, right? Um, and we were able to push, in, in, you know, I don't have a chart here. This chart only goes out to 70. We have a chart that goes out to, you know, at least 90 now with all this sort of, here's a D5, a long blue D5, right? And you can kind of see how all this, uh, all this works out, okay? All right. Um, and many, many of these, all of these differentials, um, the, these differentials we can get by machine using our deformation approach. These different, all these differentials in this range all come immediately out of computer data. This is the first one. This one that 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 um, in the 30 stem. This is the first one you have to work a little bit for. That one's not that hard. But you have to work a little bit harder for that. And then it's um, um, the next ones. I think are really not for quite some ways. Really, it's really not so bad until you get into the 50s. This blue one here. This is the first one that I think of at this point. This is the first differential that I think of as currently genuinely hard. This first one right here. Everything up to this point now, we kind of more or less think of as as easy and well known. Okay. Um, uh, there's a question: Does this push-pull approach? And let me pull up this the slide there. Um, this this push-pull approach that I'm talking about in this diagram help for extension problems? Absolutely. Same thing. We get a huge number of extensions using this approach that are detected. Um, algebraically, and then we have to do additional work for more obscure ones. And I'll give you some examples of that, um, hopefully in a few minutes. Okay, so that's kind of the story for the C-motivic case. I mean, you know, it's sort of, I talk about it in five minutes, right? But of course, it's really more like five years worth of work to kind of actually get that far and process all the data and handle elements one at a time and really kind of keep track of what's going on. But nevertheless, it's, you know, it's giving you the idea of how this goes. Okay, let's talk for a little bit about what happens more generally, okay? What about the K-motivic atom spectral sequence, okay? And we're still in the situation where minus one is a square, okay? Because then rho is zero, and we have a relatively simple formula for x, okay? We know C-motivic x in a large range, and we can get K-motivic x as long as we know the Milner K-theory of K, right? The arithmetic of K enters into it, but only kind of in this prepackaged way through the Milner K-theory. Okay, so what happens, I've drawn a little schematic over here to show you what happens, how the Adams E2 page appears. The black stuff is things that we're familiar with now. This is, you know, H0, H1, H2. This is the first three stems, right? So you have the familiar C-motivic X, X in, in black, right? And then, you, and then on each of these black dots, each of these black dots generates a copy of Milner K theory. And that's what the red arrows are supposed to indicate. The red arrows indicate copies of Milner K theory, and they could extend into, to the left into many degrees, depending on how complicated the Milner K theory is, okay? But that's the degrees they line. They don't change the Adams filtration. They do change the topological degree, and they extend off to the left, okay? So that's what the K-motivic E2 page looks like, okay? And then if you look, you can see that there is room for exotic differentials. And now by exotic, what I mean is things that don't occur C-motivically, 
right? I'm taking the C-motivic situation as understood and saying what's new when we pass to a field with arithmetic, okay? And there can be exotic arithmetic Adams differentials, okay? And to me, this is absolutely fascinating, right? The idea that you can express this subtle um, arithmetic phenomena in terms of Adams differentials, I think, is an extremely powerful and, and probably not very well explored approach. It allows you to do things like study higher structure in, in these kinds of arith arithmetic con contexts that, that, um, that the number theorists and the arithmetic geometers probably haven't really had the language or the tools to study. I mean, to a certain extent they have, but not only not, they have not pro probably not exploited the higher structure as systematically as they could. And these Adams differentials, I think, are a really great way of doing this, okay? So, um, and they really do occur, right? So Wilson and Osphere have some examples, right, where dr of tau, and tau is sitting right there, we don't see um, we don't see tau because the weight is suppressed, but this black dot is a copy of M2. It's tau free, right? It's one and tau and tau squared and tau cubed and so on and so forth. So tau is there kind of invisibly. And that tau can support a differential hitting something of the form A times H naught to the R, where A is an element of some non-zero element of Milner key theory. This really does occur in certain situations, okay? And, um, is the argument for this wilson Ostfair differential arithmetic in nature? Yes, it is. What they did is they took as known information about the et al cohomology of the, of the field in question, okay? P prior knowledge of the, of the et al cohomology of the field, allow, um, and then they used that to deduce that the differential had to occur. Okay, so currently the way that the information is flowing from already known arithmetic towards um, the, this submotivic homotopy theory. Um, I have sort of like a dream or a hope that eventually we might be able to turn that flow around, right? But that's not something that, that, that is really, think, I think, has happened yet. And so related to this, this next question, are there examples of these sorts of things being used by arithmetic geometers? I th um, uh, there might be other people who have more knowledge about this than I do. I'm, I, I think sort of currently, I think the answer is, is no, as far as I understand. But um, but I'm hopeful, right? That I mean that 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 sort of thing would would eventually occur. Okay. Um, another question: Does R this R depend on K? Yes, absolutely. That's why I wrote it this way. It could be a D two, it could be a D three, it could be higher, having depending on properties of the field. Absolutely. Okay. Their examples come from finite fields already. Okay. But you would expect this for this sort of things happen for number fields, and you know maybe in lots of other examples as well. Okay, so I'm not going to do too much with that. You know, these um, the computations get much more difficult, right? Because the arith arithmetic enters into it. But I think that we've just scratched the surface with these kinds of computations, and there is plenty of like of of opportunity for people to do more of these types of k-motivic computations. And it's just simply ready to go. These problems, we have the technology, we have the ability, we have the background that we need. It's just a question of somebody sitting down and dedicating a significant, significant amount of time to actually carrying out the computations and seeing how they play out. Okay. I don't think we're waiting for new ideas or you know anything. It's just a question of of, of somebody diving into it. Okay. So that's kind of the end of the story that I want to tell for this case where minus one is a square. Okay, and now I want to transition into talking about the situation where minus one is not a square. Okay, and the kind of like the you know the 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 the, the most elementary example of that, of course, is the field R, right? Okay, um, and. Uh, so, and this has been studied by various people, including um, Belmont, Duggar, Guy, and myself in various combinations, okay? So let me remind you about what the basic inputs to this computation are. Here's the homology of a point, okay? You have the tau, again, and you also have a free element rho, okay? And they're connected in cohomology anyway by square one of tau is rho, okay? And the, where's rho showing up here? Rho is coming from Milner K theory, right? Um, Milner K theory here is polynomial in rho. Rho is the class of minus one, Okay, modulo two, rho, k, Milner K theory modulo two, everything except, for, everything except for minus one is a square, right? Um, uh, and so that's sort of why rho is the only thing that, that, that's showing up there. But anyway, so that's what you start with, tau's and rho's, but there is this steamroad operation and that's really important. Okay, um, and then there's the, 
And there's the dual steam red algebra, which takes the same form as before with the tau's and the xi's, except now you have these two additional terms involving rho. We've, we've studied a lot. These first, the tau i squared equals tau xi i plus one. We talked about that, that relation a lot in the semotivic case, and we kind of understood the consequences of, of that term, right? But these extra rho terms here are an additional complication, okay? So what do you do when you see an additional complication? Well, the whole sort of like the whole theme of, you know, of, of late 20th century, and by late 20th century, I mean second half of the 20th century algebraic topology, the theme is you filter and use a spectral sequence, right? This is what, this is, this is what you do, right? In a situation like this, when you have complications that you don't know how to handle, you filter them away, right? And then run a spectral sequence, okay? So you filter by powers of rho, and you get a rho boxstein spectral sequence. That's really just a name. Um, but anyway, you filter by the rho boxstein spectral sequence. And what happens is that the E1 page is really understandable. It's just C motivic X with a free row adjoint, and that's going to converge to R motivic X. So that's good. At least you have a good handle on the E1 page. Okay. And it turns out that this spectral sequence is highly computable. Okay. We can do this in a lot in a fairly large range, not as far as we can do the C motivic stuff, but in, in, in a large range. It, um, the, the R motivic X is sort of red, turns out is readily available to us. Okay. And the key idea here, I'm not going to go through very many details, okay? but the key idea in this R, uh, in this, in this row box sign spectral sequence is that one thing you can do is you can invert row a priori to begin with. If you invert rho, then what happens, here, let's pull out this up so we can see the formula. If you invert rho, right, then what happens is that tau i plus one becomes expressible in terms of the other elements, okay? So you don't need tau i plus one as a generator, okay? And the result, you do need tau zero, okay? But then you don't need any of the other taus, and you do need the xis, okay? So you get F2 adjoined tau rho plus or minus one, because you've inverted rho, tau, and polynomial in tau, tau zero, c one, c two, and so forth, with no relation, right? This, this relation gets absorbed in eliminating the, the tau i plus one generator, okay? And if you look at what this guy is, and you study it a little, in a little more detail, what you discover is that it's cohomology, xed with row inverted. Xed in this context, xed is just the classical xed. Okay? Well, there is a degree shift here, so it's a little bit complicated how this isomorphism plays out in practice. But we know in advance, we know the row periodic R motivic xed. Okay? And once we know the row periodic xed in advance, then everything else has to be kind of killed by a differential. Okay, and because everything else has to be killed by a differential, we can do sort of a combinatorial game here and get most of the R mode, the, the differentials are mostly forced by, um, by combinatorics. Okay, well this, we already know this element can't survive, it's gotta support a differential, and so there's only one possibility. Those types of arguments, very naive, very combinatorial, just look at all the data and just figure out how things, how, how, figure out how things can cancel out to give you this row periodic final answer. Okay, and you can do this in a, lar in, in, in a long way. Okay, eventually you have to get more sophisticated with massy products and so forth, but not for a long time. It's highly computable. Okay, um, after you get R motivic X, you then have to think about Adams differentials in this context. And what we have found in practice, I don't have a philosophical reason for this, but we found in practice is that th the Adams differentials are really not that hard in this situation. Once you know the C motivic Adams differentials, you can pretty quickly figure out most of the R motivic differentials as well, um, using sort of naturality and various you know, types of fairly easy arguments. There's a, a few cases here and there, but it's, relative, it's, it's, it's really not the most difficult thing in this whole, in, in this, in, in this whole process, okay? So what I'm saying here, right, is that the R motivic situation is actually pretty good. We can do, uh, we can do pretty effective computations in this R motivic setup, okay? And um, this is another place where we, you know, we, we, we have done a fair amount of computations, but we could go much further, and there's nothing preventing us from doing that except somebody finding the time to sit down and simply carry out the computations. They're much more complicated and therefore much more interesting than the C motivic case. It's, it's, it's really a great, a great, great computation. Okay, and again, like it's just, just ready and waiting for someone to dive in and spend. And this is not, you know, this is not a little like light side project. This is a really heavy duty thing that takes hours and hours of work, but it would be ready to go. Okay, so let me show you sort of what comes out 
of all of this, okay? So these charts are supposed to represent this R motivic, and I've got the Adams E infinity page here, okay? So I'm actually showing you something about homotopy groups, not about R motivic X, okay? Now, I have organized these um, charts by co-weight, okay? Co-weight is a term that I defined on the first day. Let me, what that means is the difference between the topological degree and the weight, okay? Um, so you take the stem, you subtract the weight, you get the co-weight, okay? Um, some people would call that the line, right? This is the zero line, this is the one line, and so forth, okay? Um, we used to call that, I used to call that the milner witt degree, but I like this, this co-weight terminology better because it works better in the, in the equivariant context as well, okay? So um, what you see here are, um, are sort of H1 multiplications, and these red arrows are infinite row towers. They go off um, to infinity on the left. They're row multiples, and you see an H0 tower. What you're seeing here is something analogous to the Milner, um, Milner Witt K theory, right? You see, um, anyway, and, and okay, so fine, but this, and this is just algebra. There's no differentials happening here. Here, this is a picture of the one line, okay? So um, one of the things I wanna point out about this picture is that you can, you know, there was some um, relatively recent work by, um, who is it? Is it Spitzweg, Rundigs, and Ostfair? Do I think, do I have, about the one line, do I have that right? I hope. Yes, you do. Okay, all right, great. I wanna make sure everyone gets the credit they deserve, right? Some great work by these guys who thought about the one line over general fields, right? And, and sort of ex explaining what the one line would look like in, some, in terms of Milner K theory and so forth. Okay, and what I want to what I want to say is like you know if you wanted to know like how to make how would you guess the answer in advance? I mean, proving that, that that's the answer that requires hard work, regardless. But but one thing you might want to do is guess what the one line looks like, or what the two line looks like, or what the three line looks like, right? And I claim that this picture here actually can can allow you to kind of guess what the correct answer would be. Okay, um, the, the, the answer that these guys got for pi one comma zero, which is really just this, this one column, right, had three generators, okay? And, and you can see the three generators in this picture. You see rho squared H2, okay, because of that red arrow. There's a rho squared H2 there. There's tau H1, and then there's this dot on the top, okay? And those three things really do correspond to the three generators in, in pi one zero, in the one line, okay? There's a, um, this rho squared H2, that's got, and when you look at the formulas, you see there's a Milner, there's a, a Milner K2 showing up, right? In, on one generator. And that's because of the, you know, it's, it's, it's the second, you know, it's two shifts over. It's the second Milner K theory showing up here. And there's a Milner K1, sometimes written K cross, but there's a Milner K1 that's showing up there. And then there's like a Z mod two, right? And that's from that dot right there with no Milner K theory. So you could actually look at this and predict what the answer is um, is pretty easily. And then sort of as, you know, it would be more interesting going to higher line. The one line is sort of already understood, but if you look at higher lines, right, you can make some predictions, right? You're going to see things involving nu squared, right? Milner K theory times nu squared is certainly going to show up, right? It has to, right? And um, and similarly, you could make some predictions, you know, about, you know, about, about various things, what they should look like, right? And then you'd have to prove them. This doesn't prove this, right? But it gives you sort of a heur heuristic, an idea of what things are going to happen, right? Okay, and now this picture looks, this one looks manageable, right? This one looks like something you could probably, you can really wrap your head around, but this one gets much more complicated. Right? There are a lot of generators here and a lot of interesting relations. I don't want to dive into too much detail here, I just, but to give you a flavor of how quickly things are getting really rich and complicated. The one thing I want to point out about this chart, which is really quite nasty, is this green line up here at the top of this tower. Okay? Here is H3, which corresponds to the homotopy element sigma. Okay? And then you multiply, the, each, the green lines are H dot multiples or sort of like, two multiples, roughly speaking, okay? So there's two sigma, four sigma, eight sigma, okay? Now classically and C-motivically, 16 sigma equals zero. That's a really important relation that has a lot to do with Adam's periodicity and V1 periodicity and is an essential sort of fact about classical homotopy that 16 sigma is zero. But what we're seeing here is that 16 sigma is non-zero. It's detected by that guy up there at the top. 
Okay. And what that does is it throws a huge monkey wrench into the way these things work. It's saying that V1 periodicity and Adam's periodicity are behaving in a much more complicated way than they are than they are classically or semotypically. Okay. And we're, you know, and we really have not, th this is something that, that again, I think it's a, a, a topic that's ripe for exploration, but really kind of hasn't been done. We really haven't figured out what the V1 periodic consequences of that kind of bizarre behavior are. Okay. But that, that's, as I say, that's a really bizarre thing, right? You know, the classical stable homotopy theorists are really like, kind of like, trust me, they're really kind of, you know, the, they're blown away by this, right? This is really kind of almost disturbing to them. Okay. All right. So what you, one of the things you see, I don't want to go, you know, you can go into higher and higher co-weights, right? One of the things you see is in these, in these co-weights that are three mod four, right? You see these huge kind of lattices, right? Of eta multiplications and row multiplications. Okay. And that's a general phenomenon. Let me zoom out a little bit. Right, um, that that you can see that quite consistently that in the in the, in the co weights three mod four the next one's eleven and fifteen and so forth and what you're seeing up here a lot of this stuff this stuff at the top of the picture not this noise down here this is but the, all the stuff at the top of the picture this is supposed to be the v1 periodic R motivic homotopy okay another problem you know the, as I say a problem that's it's ripe for exploration compute the v1 periodic homotopy although there are as I say there are compl compl complications okay so this is great stuff it's really you know interesting um, these dashed lines are hidden extensions we'll talk about hidden extensions in a minute but there's one example that I want to show you just because of here like this is what the 12 stem, the co-weight 12, right? And you can see this really kind of complicated sequence of hidden extensions that are fitting these puzzle pieces together. There's some really, really interesting stuff happening here. Okay. We could go on for an hour just talking about this stuff, but I wanna, wanna move on to other things. Okay. Um, one of the things I wanna talk about is the K-motivic Adams spectral sequence in the case now where the field does not contain a square root of minus one, okay? So um, what happens here is that rho is, is not zero. That's precisely what this formula means. This formula precisely means that rho is not zero. And so you have these powers of rho and you have this formula for, um, for rho in the dual Stewart algebra that you have to deal with, okay? And, and so again, you could try filtering by powers of rho, okay? And there are kind of two cases. One case is when um, rho to the n is non-zero for all n, okay? So rho is like periodic elements, invertible, okay? And then this works out similar, relatively similarly to the R motivic case. You're gonna have R motivic x, then you're gonna have to adjoin Milner K theory, but you know, and I'm for sure there will be exotic Adams differentials, you know, and so forth, okay? So that one's sort of, this one is, this is the case that's, that's more similar to the R motivic situation, okay? And then you have another case, which, which is where rho is non-zero, but some power of rho is zero. Okay, and you can still handle, you can still run a row box nine spectral sequence, but then it becomes more complicated because that relation rho to the n equals zero kind of creates an edge effect and, um, and, and causes additional complications. I decided in the interest of time to not kind of go through um, the, the details, not to, dis not to discuss this in any great detail. But the point is that there, there are algebraic tools for getting at x, k, um, k motivic x in this, in this context. Okay, um, and a little bit of this has been done by Wilson and Ostvere, um for finite fields, um, where you have something like rho squared is zero or, or something like that. Okay. Okay, so um, the third part of the Adam spectral sequence program right, is to handle hidden extensions, okay? So what do I mean by this, right? I've been referring to hidden extensions and showing you examples, but let me sort of slow down here for a minute and tell you what exactly what I actually mean by that, okay? So the Adams E infinity page is not the answer we're looking for, right? It is an associated graded object of a filtration on the homotopy groups that we're looking for, okay? So what this means in practice is that when you have two dots in your Adams chart, one above the other, Okay. What that means, th that means that the, that the associated graded is Z mod two plus Z mod two. Okay. But the actual group could be, a, there's an extension problem there, right? The, the, the actual group could be Z mod two plus Z mod two, or the actual group could be Z mod four, right? 
and you have to figure out which one it is. Okay, so one option is to use machine data from related algebraic situations, and that tells you a lot of the answers. Okay, and the other option is to fiddle with total brackets, as I've written at the bottom of the screen. Okay, so use the same kinds of, of techniques. Okay, um, but the multiply, but but there's a, this is sort of the additive structure that's being hidden by the spectral sequence. Okay, and uh, let me just say this happens in practice, right? You get the Z mod four in practice sometimes. This, sometimes you do, and sometimes you don't, right? It really is a question that arises. Okay, um, you can also um, you can also have multiplicative structure that is hidden by the spectral sequence. So what I mean is you might have a product like say H one times X is zero. You might have an element, and then H one times it is zero in E infinity. Okay, but it's possible that eta, which is what's detected by H1, and bracket X, which is my name for the homotopy element detected by X, it's possible that in homotopy, eta times bracket X is non-zero. Okay, it's just detected in higher filtration. Okay, and again, these sorts of things happen all the time. Okay, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, and you have to sort them out. Okay, um, many of them can be gotten um, algebraically, but some of them, hey, you have to do in a more ad hoc manner. Okay, so let me show you, I want to say one thing here. This is a little like a little fact about the classical Adams spectral sequence, a little known fact, even by people who sort of like you'd think sort of know a lot about this. You know, we could have seen, we, you know, you've seen, many of you have probably seen this picture before, right? This is the classical Adams spectral sequence, right? And we're kind of, we all, we all sort of know when the, the first place where algebra and topology diverge, right? We all sort of know that the first place where algebra and topology diverge is right here in this first differential, right? This Adams different, this D2 of H4 equals H not H3 squared, this Hopf invariant one differential. We all sort of know this fact, right? Everything up to that point is all detected in, al in algebra. Okay, that turns out not to be true. Okay, so let me show you exactly what goes on. Let's look at this dot right here. Oh, let me just adjust this here. Um, let me try this maybe. Okay, let's see if this is better. Okay, what's going on here is it looks like H1, well, what is happening, right? H1 squared H3 plus H2 cubed is zero. Okay, that's the relation that you see right there. Right with the lines, right? H three times two H ones, or you know, one times H two times H two times H two, right? Okay, and that makes you think, right, that eta squared sigma plus nu cubed is zero. But this relation is actually false. This is not true. Okay, the correct relation is that eta squared sigma plus nu cubed equals eta epsilon, okay? And by eta and, and eta epsilon is detected by that dot there. Epsilon is detected by C0, okay? And eta epsilon is detected by that dot in higher filtration, okay? So this is, this is the correct relation, okay? I call this, oops. Toda's relation because he's the first person that I know of. He's the first person to have, have discovered this fact. Okay. This is the first place where topology differs from algebra, actually. Okay. Um, in the in the hidden extensions, right? And this is a quite complicated example of a hidden extension that happens all the way back in the nine stem. Okay. So um, so it it's gives you an example of the th sort of things you have to be quite careful about if you really want to understand the multiplicative structure in, in detail. Okay. All right, we are running out of time in this series, and so we're not going to do, I'm not going to talk about much detail about these hidden extensions other than to kind of give you a sense of flavor, a sense of the sort of things that go on. Okay, what I want to spend um, the rest of the time on is on sort of a, a kind of a different approach to computing stable homotopy groups that I think is also important. Okay. I think that this approach using the effective spectral sequence is an important, is complementary, right, to the Adam spectral sequence approach, by which I mean you really want to do both approaches, carry out both approaches at the same time. There are certain features that are easily seen in the Adams context, and there are other features that are more easily seen in the effective context. And then when you put those two perspectives together, you get a much better um, overall perspective. On, on these computations, okay? So 
um, to, you know, sort of to briefly kind of set this up, right? So K-motivic homotopy theory has something uh, called the effective filtration, okay? It's also sometimes called the slice filtration, but I, um, I, 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 I discourage people from using that word in the motivic context because slice filtration means something entirely different in the equivariant context, okay? The, 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 the two, um, the motivic slice filtration and the equivariant slice filtration don't really um, correspond to each other. They're the same kind of thing, but they don't really correspond in any concrete way. And it's very dangerous to kind of be using the same word. Uh, but, um, so I call it the effective filtration, but you know, same thing, okay? And so because the whole category has, has a filtration, right? In particular, each object gets a filtration, right? Um, and I've kind of drawn the filtration along this row. Okay, and then there are the cofibers, right? The cofiber of this map is SQ, right? The cofiber of this map is SQ minus one, and so forth, right? And as always, whenever you have this kind of a filtration situation, you get an spectral sequence, right? That goes from the homotopy of these slices and converges to the homotopy of X. And this is sort of like the st standard setup for a spectral sequence. Okay, so, but if you want this to be practical, right? You need to know how to compute the E1 term. Okay, so you need to know how to compute the slices of S0, zero, zero. Okay, well, fortunately, there are, we do have a good description of the slices of S0, zero, zero. Let me emphasize, this is you know, sort of over arbitrary K. All right, and again, sort of in the interest of time, I think I wanna kind of skip the details of, of, of this story, and I'm not really sort of an, ex, I'm not really the, the, you know, an expert on this stuff anyway, so there are other people who could say more. But basically, you have to pass through the, the uh, motivic cobordism spectrum, MGL, which has a very nice um, slice decomposition, okay, and analyze a little further. And, and what you get in the end is a formula for the slices of, of, of S00, okay? That involves this complicated thing, this X BP star BP, BP star BP star, okay? Tensor HZ, okay? And what this is, this is the formal name for the Adams Novikov E2 page, okay? So this is an entirely algebraic machine computable thing, okay? Um, and it's, it's the Adams-Novikov E2 page, right? So the upshot is that the, the, the slices of, S, of the sphere are expressible in terms of HZ as well as the classical Adams-Novikov E2 page, okay? And so that means it's sort of like there's, it's, it's a practical thing to do, right? As long as you can understand something about the motivic homology, HZ star, over whatever field you're working with, right? As long as you can have a good grasp on HZ star, um, then you're then you're in good shape for setting up the ad for starting um, slice uh, effective spectral sequence computations. Okay, and I should say that this idea is due to Rundig, Spitzvik, and and, and Ostfer, um, which is and it's a, this is a really nice result, as it means that the slice the effective spectral sequence is practical. Okay, um, one uh, so uh, um, what do I want to say here? Let me skip that and just say this, okay? So um, when you look in the C motivic case, okay, you want to, so, and, you, and you should always think about that situation just as, you know, as a first case to see how things fit together. What you find is that the C motivic effective spectral sequence equals the C motivic Adams Novikov spectral sequence, which I believe is an idea that, that's due to Levine, okay? But in general, it is not true that the effective spectral sequence is the same as the Adams-Novikov spectral sequence. Obviously, those spectral sequences are related because the E1 page, the effective E1 page, has something to do with the Adams-Novikov E2 page. But they are not the same. We know from examples that they are not the same. Okay, and what I want to say, and, and this kind of this is sort of an important philosophical point that I want to make right here, that the effective spectral sequence is really better than the K-motivic Adams-Novikov spectral sequence. My feeling is that the K-motivic Adams-Novikov spectral sequence is probably just too complicated and too hard to really compute with in practical terms, and that we should be using the effective spectral sequence instead. Okay, it's kind of like, it's, it's sort of like the better, it's sort of an improvement on Adam Novikov in the K-motivic context. Okay, uh, so, um, so we saw for the sphere that, let me just pull up the formula again here at the top of the screen. We saw from this, for the sphere that we can express uh, the slices of S0, 0 in terms of some Adam Novikov E2 page. Okay, and that actually happens kind of generally. Okay, for reasonable choices of X, 
okay? The, um, the effective E1 page is expressible in terms of some classical adams novikov spectral sequence for some classical analog of X, okay? I don't mean this as a theorem, I just mean more mean this as a principle, okay? So one example of this has to do with connective real K theory, little ko, okay? Um, we've, we've secretly, we've actually been talking about this little KO in previous lectures, although I haven't mentioned it by name, because it's Adam's spectral sequence is this A of one, this X over A of one computation that we made yesterday, okay, converging to the pi star of KO. So we've actually talked about its Adam's spectral sequence without calling it that, okay. The Adams, uh, the Adams Novikov spectral sequence for little ko looks like this. You have a, you have uh, the boxes represents copies of z, and the dots represent copies of, of z mod two. Okay, so you have a gen, uh, the identity there. You have h one multiples going up. You have the, you know, two times h one is zero. That's the z mod two there, and then you have a v one squared polynomial in v one squared as well. That's the E2 page. And then there are Adams differentials here, which correspond, if you go back and you look at our May spectral sequence computations, you can find the analog for this, this differential. That's what the Adams Novikov spectral sequence for KO looks like. Okay, this is like a well known you know, fact from classical topology. Okay, well, and the point I wanna make is that if you use, you can use this well known fact from classical topology in order to write down the effective E1 page for little kq. This is the sort of the cover, appropriate cover of, of big kq, of periodic Hermitian k theory. Okay, so, um, so, the, so you take this situation here, this situation where you've got the h1 towers and then also the multiples of v1 squared, powers of v1 squared, okay? And you double check what all the grading and the indices and the filtrations are, and here's the picture that you get. Um, so in this picture, what I've got, again, the topological degree is on the um, horizontal axis. The slice filtration, the effective filtration is on the vertical axis and the weights at once as, as always are suppressed, okay? Um, so you see that here's the H1 tower and then there's V1 squared, which is in effective filtration two, and you'll have a V1 to the fourth and a V1 to the sixth and a V1 to the eighth and so forth, okay? The red arrows indicate this, you know, um, that you have to have, well here you, it means the homology HZ, right? Here it means HZ mod two, right? So you have sort of, you know, um, things from arithmetic showing up along these red, along these red lines. Okay. Um, um, and then I, and then it turns out that there, that there are, in, in this case for a little KQ, there are differentials, right? Uh, on, on tau squared, which is sort of invisible in that place, right? Um, up, to, up to something rho squared tau H1, and there's also a differential there and, and so forth. So, um, so this kind of gives you a sense, this is, has a similar feel. Uh, well, this is a good, this, you know, A of one, this KQ is a kind of a good test case for kind of getting familiar with the way these effective spectral sequences work. Um, but again, I think it's totally practical that one could carry out the effective spectral sequence in a large range, at least for things like R motivic homotopy theory. For sure, in R motivic homotopy theory, you'd be able to do quite a bit of it, right? And perhaps for other fields as well, where the Milner K theory is, 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 is well known, okay? So there are lots of interesting things going on, um, going on with the effect of spectral sequence that, um, that again, these are problems that are sort of ripe for further exploration. Okay, so we're almost at the very end here, right? And um, it's almost a little bit, it's, uh, it's a bit unfair to the, uh, to the listeners to sort of spring a whole new subject on you at this point. Okay, so let me not do any hard work here, right? And let me just sort of say some words about the C2 equivariant stable homotopy groups, okay? So we are making progress on the Adam spectral sequence for C2 equivariant homotopy theory. As always, the inputs to that are the homology of a point and the motivic dual steering algebra. Oh, sorry, not the motivic, the equivariant dual steering algebra. Okay, and there's a little discussion here about what the homology of a point looks like, which I don't want to get into now because we we're because we're almost out of time. But the homology of a point is understood. Okay, it's got extra com. It's it's similar to our motivic homology of a point, but has some additional stuff in it that makes it more complicated. The equivariant um, the equivariant Steenward algebra is quite similar to the R motivic Steenward algebra. You just have to extend scalars. 
right? So you start with the R motivic stimulant algebra over, over the R motivic homology of a point. You extend the scalars to the C2 equivariant homology of a point, and that's your stimulant algebra. Okay, and that's good news, right? What that means is that you can leverage your R motivic computations. Okay, the R motivic computations end up telling you a lot about this C2 equivariant context. Okay, not everything, right? Um, this, this, these, this extra complication in the homology of a point does matter, does show up, and that's this sort of negative cone that I'm referring to. It does create additional complications. Okay, but the point is that the R mo having done R motivic computations in advance gives you a huge step up, a huge advantage to get started. Okay, and these details are being kind of filled in. Um, currently, I don't want to say anything about that. Um, one, um, one, one sort of like last idea that I would like to mention, right? So this is about the atoms spectral sequence, and we're making progress on the atom spectral sequence in the C2 equivariant context and learning new things about equivariant stable homotopy groups. But um, there's another idea uh, due to some recent work of Hannah Kong, right? Which is that one ought to be able to apply this effective spectral sequence technology in the equivariant context, okay? So what, here's what you do, right? So you have an R motivic effective filtration of the sphere, okay? You can apply Betty realization to the R motivic effective filtration of the sphere to get a, a filtration of the equivariant sphere. Okay, and then you can try to run the spectral sequence associated to that filtration of the equivariant sphere. Okay, and this is like our test computations indicate to us that this is a totally practical thing to do. Okay, it's this is an, what, 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 what we're proposing here with the C2 effective spectral sequence is not the same as the well known equivariant slice spectral sequence, it's not the same as the equivariant Adams Novikov spectral sequence. Okay. I'm claiming that it's better than either of these other spectral sequences for computing the homotopy groups of the sphere. Okay. The equivariant slice spectral sequence is a great tool for computing the homotopy groups of certain types of equivariant spectra, but it's not so good for the sphere. Okay. I think this effective spectral sequence is much more um, useful for the sphere. Okay. And this is a nice illustration right, of what, how these motivic ideas right, about the effective filtration are coming back to telling us something new, right? About a more kind of a more topological and equivariant situation, right? And sort of we, we motivic homotopy theorists ought to be kind of proud of those sorts of things when we can teach the topologists, right? Or the equivariant topologists something new that they, um, that they hadn't realized before. That's sort of like a feather in our cap. That's an achievement for us, right? So a um, uh, couple questions. Okay, so is there a hope that you can do things k motivically for a field k in order to understand things in the, I mean, I think it's gamma of k, I think this person means Galois group uh, equivariant setting, or is the story really only for r and c? Okay, so um, that's a good question. See, the point here is that what is c2 doing here? c2 is really the Galois group of c over r, right? And so that's why r motivic has something to do with c2 e um, equivariant. Okay, and so the question is, well, if you work over an arbitrary K, could you perhaps, you know, get a Galois equivariance? So, yes, um, I, 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 it seems like a plausible story. However, the complications are going to be the profinite aspects of the Galois group are going to have to enter the picture. And so it's, you know, you're going to have to deal with all that profinite topology and all that, and all that stuff. And it, it seems to me like to be a very, very hairy subject. I mean, I know a lot of these things are, people are making progress on straightening out a lot of these details and that's great. Um, but I think that there's kind of a lot of sort of underlying pro technology kinds of things that, that kind of get, it, get, that get in the way that have to be resolved in order to make a story like that actually practical. Okay, have I tried this on the, Omega spectrum, the spectrum omega that HHR used for the covariant variant one theorem. Okay, so um, in the in uh, Hill, Hopkins, Ravenel, they kind of construct this spectrum omega using norms and sort of versions, equivariant versions of MU, and um, and they study the homotopy of this thing and they kind of solve this big problem about covariant variance in classical topology. Okay, and so the question is whether there's sort of somehow where how how does that spectrum fit into this picture. So I, I don't know, 
okay? Um, but the question that I would, the first question I would ask is whether you can even sort of like construct the spectrum omega in any kind of motivic context, right? These guys are using like equivariant tools like norms and things like that, that I don't know necessarily work so well motivically. I mean, maybe they do and maybe they don't, but that's really kind of where I would be, I would start this project. I would ask myself, to what extent does the story about norms translate back to the motivic situation and see if you can kind of even define omega. Um, it would probably be interesting to compute our motivic omega if such a thing existed, but I don't know that it exists. I have no reason, and it's certainly possible that it doesn't exist, right? It's certainly possible the equivariant omega is not in the image of um, of is not in the image of Betty realization, right? See, yeah, exactly. You want to start with something involving MGL in the R motivic situation, but it's just not clear whether you can really do it in a, in a way, and then realize to that it realizes to the to the ones that Hill Hopkins gravitable. Maybe it is. I'm not saying, but I I just don't have any I don't have any evidence one way or another there. Okay. All right, so um, I'm about out of time and I'm about out of notes as well. So this is a um, uh, place for me to stop. Thank you very much, Dan, for an absolutely fascinating lecture series. Thanks a lot. Um, and we can have more questions from the attendees. Please ask your questions in the Q&A. Okay, there's a comment about my passion for the ship. Yeah, you know, um, I am, I, I feel very fortunate to have stumbled across this program. I mean, it's not, it's not a project, it's a program. It's sort of like a life's work at this point, right? That um, is like as interesting to me personally, right? I, I'm very fortunate to have something like that, that is just like, that, 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 that's so, you know, um, fascinating that, you know, the stable homotopy ring is this incredibly intricate, complicated, you know, uh, uh, thing that you can study calculationally and um it, it it's just i'm just my personality is very well suited to this type of problem and i'm very fortunate to have to, to have something like that to, to work on uh could you say a word about how the effective spectral sequence comes about um i'm gonna i think i'm gonna decline this question it's sort of there's sort of a, a long story here um and uh I'm not super familiar enough with the details off the top of my head to really be able to say anything intelligent. There are certainly people in this um, in this video conference right now who would be able to kind of free, you know, to to speak freely about that sort of thing. But like, but but I'm not the I'm I'm not the 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 the, the person to do that. Sometimes it's best to know when you're not, you know, when you to um, to know when to retreat, right? And this is one of those situations. Could you say one more time how the C two effective spectral sequence uh, comes about, or yeah, what's its relation sure, with sure. So what you do, right, is you have you 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 have um, the. Yeah, let me just write it. So you, you look, say so you work in the R motivic context, okay? And so what you have, right, is the, um, you have an R motivic filtration here, right? SQ of the sphere, SQ minus one of the sphere and so forth, okay? So you take this whole diagram, okay? And then you Betty realize it, okay? And, you know, and you get something equivariant, right? So these guys, let's just call them, you know, they don't necessarily have a name. They don't necessarily have much of a meaning except that they exist, okay? But what happens, and then the same thing with the, with, um, with this, let's call them capital S for slice or something, right? Same thing with these things, okay? Except the thing is that, you see, we know that things like HZ, go to equivariant HC and HF2, motivic HF2 goes to HF2 and the motivic sphere goes to the equivariant sphere. Okay, so the point is that you actually know what the, um, see here, 
here we know these these motivic slices in terms of of Eilenberg McLean objects, right? They split as Eilenberg McLean objects and we have a good handle on, on what those things are. And so therefore these layers are also built out of Eilenberg, equivariant Eilenberg McLean objects, okay? So we can actually, even though we don't have good categorical names for what any of these, for what any of these objects are, we do have a perfectly fine filtration of the equivariant sphere whose layers are in terms of equivariant Eilenberg McLean objects. And so we can write down the E1 page and compute. And of course, this map, this, this Betty functor is gonna, by, you know, it's gonna induce, by naturality, will induce maps between differentials, right, in the, in the effective spectral sequences. So differentials over here will, will imply differentials over here and, and vice versa to a certain extent, okay? Mark, does that answer? Your question. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Thanks very much. Okay. Yeah. It's a really. I, th I think it's a really kind of. It, before, so sorry. Thanks for. Going yeah. It, it it's not a really it's not a sophisticated idea, right? But it's but it turns out that it you know it, it, it's a, it's it looks to be surprisingly useful. So okay. let me uh, follow up on that. Is there a version of the deformation theory description in the real Betty case? I would love to know the answer to that question. There is not currently, but I think there ought to be, and that would be, and and that would be a great, that would be a great thing to have. Okay, sounds like an interesting question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you think it is possible in the future to know all of the homotopy groups? Um, well, it sort of depends on. Okay, so it sort of depends on what you mean by no. So first of all, there is this thing in stable homotopy theory called the Mahowald uncertainty principle. Okay, and the Mahowald uncertainty principle says something like, I forget, there's, there's a kind of a nice way of phrasing it, but this, essentially what it says is this, is that any algebraic tool, right, or any kind of finite collection of algebraic tools that you have for approximating the stable homotopy groups is going to kind of like eventually fail, right, and, and have, um, and then you'll have to do some like find additional techniques. Right? So there's no sort of purely algebraic way to describe all of the, there. Uh, someone in the, in the chat, someone has quoted uh, the, uh, the, 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 the text of it. Thank you. Um, and, and, and so from that, and, and I certainly agree with that philosophy. However, notice what it says. If you look at the text of it, it says something specific about using, that can be named using homological algebra, right? So maybe there are other more sophisticated algebraic tools that we don't know about, right? That have never been you know, thought of or discovered that could potentially be used to describe all of the stable homotopy groups. I would not rule that out. I think that there's you know, the, the potential for that kind of, that, that that, that kind of thing, but of course it's highly speculative, right? And, um, and, we just, and, and we just don't know. Okay, is there a motivic story of genera like there is classically, which allows us to interpret motivic stable stems as target for cobordism invariance of schemes? <clears throat> uh, I don't know. You know, I mean, the, the role of MGL is sort of, is more complicated than the role of MU in, uh, in, 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 in topology, right? So it, it strikes me as a sort of thing that's likely to have some serious, so serious difficulties, but I don't really know. Uh, there are non-cellular objects in motivic homotopy theory. What is their role in this picture? Could they be approached by an Adams spectral sequence? So um, the role of the non-cellular objects in my picture is that essentially they don't exist, okay? I've been talking a lot about motivic homotopy theory, but really I've been working in cellular motivic homotopy theory, okay? So I'm looking at the subcategory of objects that are built out of spheres, okay? And this is, you know, this is good and it's bad. It's good because it makes the category much more tractable, tractable to computation. It's bad because it, um, it, uh, doesn't capture all of the geometry and arithmetic that you might want to study, right? Things of invariance of elliptic curves are is stuff that, you know, mo motivic homotopy theorists ought to be caring about, right? Computing these sort of, you know, homotopical invariance of an elliptic curve is, you know, is definitely something we should care about. And that's basically inaccessible from my perspective, okay? The problem is that these types of spectral sequences that I use 
aren't going to converge in those cases. Okay. Um, or they're going to, they're going to converge to a cellular approximation of, you know, of, of something like an elliptic curve, which is going to miss a lot of the interesting geometry. Okay. So there, that's the sort of like the limitations of this method for sure at getting at those types of things. Can you provide an idea of what sort of motivic information is lost when you pass through the Betty realization functors to the equivariant setting? Okay, so the, the, the real information that's lost when you pass from our motivic to Betty realization is exactly what I was just saying. All that sort of geometric non-cellular stuff is for sure gonna be lost when you pass to the C2 equivariant setting. Okay, but in terms of the cellular information in the R motivic homotopy and C2 equivariant homotopy, um, the, um, the way, I think that there's sort of, a, there is a reasonably good way of summarizing that. And there's a slogan here that I didn't have time to talk about, but it's written here right in the middle of the slide, right? So there, is, um, there are results of Barron's and Shaw that say, that make precise this idea that C2 equivariant homotopy theory is the tau period periodicization of R motivic homotopy theory, okay? And what that means is a little bit complicated because tau is not actually even an element, it's not a map in R motivic homotopy theory. It doesn't survive the Robachtine spectral sequence, but it's sort of like tau is some sort of like, you know, some, some periodicity operator, okay? Um, or some bracket or something like that. And so they make precise this idea right, that C2 equivariant is the, is the tau periodization of R motivic. So what you lose, right, is, you know, the tau period, is the, is the tau torsion, right? Whatever tau torsion means in this context, that's the sort of thing you lose, okay? So one specific example of that is the eta periodic homotopy. The R motivic homotopy category has a rich eta periodic theory, Okay, there, where you can compute the eta, we've computed the eta periodic homotopy groups completely in the R motivic context, and you get a really interesting, complicated example. Equivariantly, the the eta periodic groups essentially collapse. There's like there's there's the identity element, and so it's it's non-zero, but just barely, right? Basically, there's the identity element, and that's it. Okay, so the eta periodic story equivariantly is much less interesting. Okay, and what this slogan is saying is that all of this eta periodic R motivic homotopy theory is tau torsion. Okay, and then, so it's not being detected um, equivariantly. That's sort of roughly speaking. Way. But, but again, remember also all of the non cellular stuff will also sort of somehow disappear um, when you go past to equivariance. Okay, is there any application of motivic methods to complications of symplectic cobordism ring of the point that you know? Not that I know of. But yeah, sure. Compute the symplectic cobordism ring of the point. Okay, I think that concludes all the great questions. So let's thank uh, Dan once again.